So from the last video, I wrote out every single microstate from the P2 configuration. Uh, so let's go back to the original problem. So if you remember, we have the hexa-agua ion of uh, vanadium-3, which is a, a D2 configuration. And we know that obviously this is going to be in the octahedral point group. Um, but of course, to, to understand sort of the spectroscopy in the octahedral point group, we have to go back and figure out you know, what the spectroscopy would look like if it was just a free ion. So we're going to have to start with that idea and work our way through the problem. So the, the key thing is, is that the process here is exactly the same as when um, I worked through the P2 problem. Uh, the only difference now is, is that we have a lot more um, well, we, now we have five orbitals as opposed to three. We still have two electrons. Um, but basically, because I have five orbitals that are degenerate and two electrons to put in those five orbitals, um, the first factorial um, in the equation now has a 10. So in the end, you add everything up and you're going to need to find 45 individual microstates. And having 45 microstates, is quite a big operation. Um, so what I'm gonna kind of work through is um, very quickly is just to just to you know kind of illustrate the shorthand again. So remember, if we have this specific electron configuration, we can say that you know electron one has an ML value of of two, and it's spin up. That's why there's a there's a plus sign. And then if we sort of look at the um, MS value and ML value for the second electron, the ML value is, is plus one. And then of course the MS value is plus one half. So that is this configuration. And then the sum of, of um, both of the M sub L's is three. And then obviously the sum of the two S's gives you one. So we see very easily that that's a triplet state. But you can actually go through and write all of these out, but I'm going to do this very fast this time because I don't want to write them all out. I'm just going to illustrate to you, if you just, for example, pick the ML value of plus three, you'll find that there's four possibilities of, of how to put those electrons into those two orbitals. That's it. Every possible combination, and as you can tell from this, two of them are singlets, two of them are triplets, but let's not harp on that too much. So if you kind of figure out how many possible states can you make uh, from when you have an ML value of plus uh, four, which is the maximum you can possibly have here. And as you can tell, that's going to basically give you a singlet state. And there's only one possibility. So that's already telling you now that in this, in this whole possible scheme, you can go up to effectively an L value um, that has a maximum of four and then the minimum L value is zero. And then you're gonna find that as a result of doing this, you, you can find L values of four, three, two, one, and zero. And then you just really have to figure out the spin states, but let's just kind of work through this little by little. So then if you kind of do the same thing, here's the possible um, ways of, of distributing um, the orbitals to give you um, effectively a uh, ML value of, of two plus, which uh, looks like there's a typo there, but that's okay. Um, and then you, you sort of work through and there's another, what other ways can you get to plus where you can put both um, electrons into the ML equals one orbital. And then you can just continue this process. But what I'm gonna show you is, is that you don't have to write out every individual microstate. If we can determine the values of L and S, we can kind of do this a lot faster. Um, but what you basically did here is if you make all the microstates for all the positive ML values, you can take everything on the right side of this chart, multiply it by minus one, and you'll generate everything on the, the left side of the chart. And now how do you kind of break everything into the possible states? So 
what we're going to do is each of the term symbols remember is going to be written as uh, as two s plus one or you know if you actually prefer you can still use um you know n plus one for number of unpaired electrons um and l is the the maximum value of l so we're going to start with l equals four and then we kind of figure out what is the, what are the possible values of of ms for that configuration and what you get from this is this one's incredibly simple um, if you just kind of look, there's only one microstate there. And then, of course, there's going to be one microstate that kind of traverses across all of, all of those values where the only spin multiplicity you can possibly have is, uh, is a singlet, so the capital M S value is zero. So that really tells you when, when L is equal to four, that's a G term, and it would be just written as G, and then we already know it's a singlet. So what does that mean? Well, basically, if it goes from minus four to plus four, there's nine entries on the top of this table. So what that tells you is, is that the G microstate uh, or the G term is basically um, going to have nine degenerate microstates. And what you're going to do is, is we take one from each of these columns, one value out from each one. And I'm just going to do that. And pretty much we know that if we had G, we pull out the G's. Then guess what? You go to L equals three. And there's going to be a term for L equals two. There's going to be a term for L equals one and L equals zero. But when you have L equals three, you see what immediately happens. Now you have MS values that span from, you know, basically minus one to plus one. So that's a triplet. So this basically tells you that it's a triplet F, and then what are you going to do? Well, you remove one of these from each um, from each of those columns all the way um, from three uh, all the way down. And then you see that's going to eliminate a lot of possibilities. So that tells you we had effectively now, if you're keeping count, we had singlet G triplet. F. And now guess what's next? We have two to minus two, so that's going to be a D term. And then you can see again, there's only the possibility for singlet. So that's a singlet D, and then we remove five more microstates from the middle uh, row. Then what's left is now we're down to L equals um, where L equals one. So you can see again one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is going to be for a triplet P. Let's remove them. And then what are we left with? Um, effectively a singlet S. So if you put this all together, we had singlet G, triplet S, singlet D, triplet P, singlet S. And it's that simple. So those are those are the 45 microstates that are that are possible. And then remember. Um, because G ran from plus four to minus four, that had a degeneracy of nine. F went from three to minus three, so there's basically seven ML values, but there's a, a spin triplet, so there's 21 possible degenerate microstates for the triplet F manifold. Singlet D is basically just got a degeneracy of five. Triple P, like it was in carbon, has a degeneracy of nine and singlet S has a degeneracy of one. And if you add them all up, you'll see that that gives you the 45 microstates uh, for the, the free ion term of a, of a D2 um, electronic configuration. So that's the deduction process. And as you, as you can tell, it's the same process over and over and over again. But if you can kind of figure out a few simple things, you can, you can basically determine from this what's going to be the ground term. So we've, we've established that we've got these five atomic states. And the lowest energy, remember, goes back to using Hund's rules. So you want the highest spin multiplicity. So there's only two triplets here. So it's going to be one of those. But then for the, for the states of the same spin multiplicity, the ground state has to have the larger number or the larger value of, of L. So triplet F is the ground state. And that's really it. So that's the most relevant um, configuration for figuring out sort of the ground state um, properties. Then um, the four other 
states that are mentioned up here are all excited states. So if you kind of work through all of these free ion terms and they get more complicated, imagine, you know, D3, D4, D5, it's all worked out for you in this table and then nothing else really to, to sort of concern yourselves with in, in any of these cases, but you can get to a lot of, uh, a lot of free ion terms. So what's left to do? Um, well, we, we only considered electron-electron um, interactions and spin-spin interactions. Now what happens if we combine them together? Well, that's called spin orbit coupling, and that's actually given a new quantum number, J, where J is effectively the coupling of, you can see there's the, uh, there's the orbit, there's the spin. And you're going to see that that is going to now give you designations for all the sublevels that are possible within a degenerate set of a, of a configuration. So, for example, we have the triplet F ground state. So, if you think about what the triplet F ground state really means, um, remember that that's where you know L is three. And we know that S is one, so L plus S gives you four. And then you can have values that go all the way up to the absolute value of L minus S. So, and then three minus one obviously is two. So that's the range that J can span in this particular case. So these are the spin orbit coupling sublevels now. And the way that this is going to work is the lowest energy spin orbit coupled state is when you have less than half filled shells, the lowest J is the lowest energy. So remember we have um, degenerate set of 5D orbitals, so this is much less than half full. So it's gonna follow um, those rules exactly. So you're gonna have effectively a triplet F4, triplet F3, and a triplet F2. And the triplet F2 is gonna be the lowest energy State in that in that grouping. If you go beyond half-filled shells, the highest value of J ends up being the lowest in energy. So you basically flip around um, the ordering, uh, but it's still ordered because of spin orbit coupling. And then when you have a half-filled shell, only one value of J is, is actually plausible to, to have. So in this case, though, for the D2 configuration, the triplet F2 is the actual ground state. So let's now um, you know, kind of think about what this all means to us. So when we started out, we're trying to understand why there's multiple absorption bands in the visible spec portion of the spectrum for the, for the hexa-agua vanadium three plus cation. And we started with this free ion, so there's no ligand spherical symmetry. And if the two electrons are in five equal energy um, d orbitals, you got 45 microstates that then break out into five different spectroscopic terms. And then we know that the triplet F um, term is the ground term. And that's basically because this one maximized spin multiplicity and maximized orbital angular momentum. And then if we consider spin orbit coupling, remember that the triplet F um, F2 is the uh, is now the ground state. But if we go back now to the spectroscopic selection rules that we had, think about this. We have a triplet F ground state term and a triple T somewhere as an excited state term. And what we already said is, is that spin allowed transitions only occur between states of the same spin multiplicity. So only electron configurations derived from the triplet F or the triplet T are going to be relevant to the vanadium uh, three plus absorption spectrum of the uh, of the hexagua ion. And then of course, remember Laporte allowed transitions only occur between orbitals of different parity. So the other thing here is is that we're going to have D to D transitions, and they are going to be effectively a G to a G transition. And the problem we're going to have is obviously is those are Laporte's forbidden. And I will discuss in a future slide um, what vibronic coupling is that then slightly relaxes that, that rule. But what is important for us is the only atomic states that matter in all of this for, for the hexog with vanadium three plus uh, ion is the, the triplet F and the triplet P. 
And I think that should hopefully give you a sense of what's important. Then the next step of this process is going to be taking the free ion terms and then putting those into an octahedral ligand field. Thank you.